Good evening. Welcome to the Sunday evening service uh, here at Lake Crest Baptist Church. So glad that you've joined us by way of the internet, uh, Facebook Live, and then, of course, a little bit later on in the evening, uh, well, it'll be archived on our uh, church's YouTube channel. And so thank you for joining us tonight, wherever you may be watching from. I'm so thrilled that you're here. And uh, we're going to sing a hymn tonight, uh, hymn number uh, 29 in our songbook. That doesn't mean anything to you if you don't have a songbook in front of you. But it's uh, at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. Let's sing it together. Sing it out. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Sing it on the last verse, but drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Sing it with me. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give. Thank you for singing with me, wherever you may be uh, joining us this, this evening. And uh, I'm especially excited about the service tonight, uh, not just about the service, but what happens after the service. You know, so much of church is, uh, is the fellowship of God's people. And after the service tonight, we're going to have our uh, drive through ice cream and prayer time. Uh, beginning at 7.15, so there'll be plenty of time for you to get down here, and uh, we'll try to end the service just a few minutes earlier than we normally would, and uh, to give folks time, but uh, so much of church is the fellowship of God's people, and uh, it won't be just the same because everybody needs to stay in their car, but at least you'll be able to see folks uh, from a distance, maybe, if, those, if you get here whenever uh, others do, and uh, wave at each other, and that kind of thing. When you pull into the parking lot this evening, uh, you're going to stay next to the brick building by the, by the mailbox along the, the, uh, the old chapel area, and uh, there'll be tables set up uh, uh, distances apart, uh, one for ice cream, one for uh, bottled water, another for soft drinks, and our staff is helping us out uh, with, uh, with distributing those, and they'll have the masks on. I meant to bring my mask with me to the pulpit. I was going to model it for you tonight so that you could see it. It's, uh, it's really cute. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, we'll have masks and gloves on. And then uh, once, you, once you pull away from there, they'll direct you. My wife and I will be stationed at the front of the auditorium right there by the main doors. And so if you pull down next to the brick building and then make a hard left there and then come alongside the sidewalk, and uh, we'd like to meet and greet with you for just a few seconds, really, and maybe uh, uh, chit-chat for a moment and then maybe have a word of prayer with you. But uh, just, you know, just something to, number one, help you get out of the house a little bit and then uh, get you to the church property and, and be able to uh, make that connection with you. We look forward to that. Uh, I think that's why I'm a little bit more excited about tonight than I, even I usually am. And, and I love the Lord's Day. I love, I love church, and I hope you do as well. And, uh, and so we'll look forward to that. Uh, please be reminded, uh, we ask, we're asking uh, everyone to stay in their vehicle. I know there's going to be uh, such a temptation for you to want to, you know, get out of the car and, and uh, chit-chat with folks in the parking lot, but we really, we, we really can't do that, okay? And so uh, uh, please help us with that. And uh, if you want to pull up beside someone, you know, once you've gone through the line and, and, uh, and chat that way for a few minutes, that'll be okay. But, but please stay in your vehicle 
and uh, the buildings will be locked, uh, the, their, the, the restrooms will not be available, and so make sure that, uh, that you keep that in mind before you come. And so uh, that's, uh, of course, after service tonight. Next Sunday's Mother's Day. And I want you to, obviously, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity uh, to express your love and appreciation for, uh, for your wife and your mother. And, and uh, kids, do something good for your mom. And uh, husbands, don't forget uh, to, to make sure that we uh, express that appreciation. And that will be honoring to the Lord as well. I'm excited about the days ahead. It won't be long. Uh, I don't know exactly when the restart date, the, the grand reopening of our church is going to be, but I'm looking forward to it, and I know that you are as well, and, uh, and so uh, be much in prayer about that. Ask the Lord to give us wisdom about doing the right thing in the right way, and that's really, that's my heart, and uh, I've been on conference calls this week with uh, people like Attorney David Gibbs, uh, Lee Chatfield, who is the uh, Speaker of the House over in Lansing at, uh, at the State Capitol, and uh, Brother Treber and others, and uh, just trying to get a gauge on what's the right thing to do. We know what the right thing to do is, but the timing is very critical, and it's not the same for everyone in every state and every community, and we understand that. And so just ask the Lord to give us wisdom about that, and, uh, and we're just going to be trusting in him. And in the meantime, we want to draw closer to him. And so I uh, appreciate your prayers about all of that. We'll share some more prayer requests with you in just a few moments. But before we do that, we're going to have another missionary spotlight video this evening. I enjoyed so much hearing from Brother Kevin Wynn this morning. If you didn't see that video this morning, uh, I, I encourage you, go to the YouTube page. Uh, at least long enough to see that video from Brother Wynn down in Mexico City. God is doing some amazing things down there. Uh, people are getting saved by the hundreds and even thousands in Mexico City, and uh, we rejoice in all of that. Tonight we're going to hear uh, from one of our newest uh, church planters. Uh, he was just with us back in February. Brother Caleb Finley and his wife Autumn are on deputation. They're raising support to go to the greater San Francisco Bay Area to start the Baylight Baptist Church. Uh, of course, Brother Caleb is Dr. Rick Finley's uh, son, and uh, we're excited about how God is going to use Caleb and Autumn there in the Bay Area. And so tonight, uh, we'll enjoy this uh, greeting and update video uh, from Brother Finley. Hey, everybody. We are Caleb and Autumn Finley. We uh, have spent the last three weeks in Canton, Georgia, and just wanted to give you an update on where we are with deputation during this COVID-19 situation. So our last meeting was actually all the way on March 15th. So we haven't had any meetings between then and now. We did do some updates at some of our supporting churches, but no scheduled meetings. And so we've kind of been at a standstill, just like every other missionary and church planner. So we've used this time to spend time with family. Um, we spent a lot of time exercising. Yeah. We've probably done more exercising in the last four weeks than we have in our entire marriage. It's true. Yeah. So, uh, but spent some time with family. We spent some time preparing for the future. And of course, that's kind of a step of faith just because we don't know when this is all going to be done. But I have spent some time scheduling new meetings for the rest of the year and even for next year on the West Coast. And I have to say, this is great news because we have really no open dates for the rest of the year. One or two maybe, but the Lord has blessed. And so we actually do have a meeting this Sunday, our first in a very long time. It's in North Carolina. Two meetings, actually. They'll both be live streamed. And then we have three more meetings after that in May. Again, some of those are live streams. Some of those are done in person. June and July, same thing. And then August, our schedule gets very busy. August through the, the beginning of December. And so we're looking forward to getting back to being able to share our vision with church families. And again, we spent this time with family. We've been here in Canton, Georgia for three weeks, headed back to North Carolina. But I do want to say this. We haven't had any churches who have dropped their support for us, as far as we know. And uh, so that's a huge blessing. Yeah. And so none of this has changed. Our timeline hasn't changed. We're still going to move to the Bay Area in December, Lord willing, and then start our Bible study in March, continue raising support on the West Coast. And then in October of 2021, we're going to start the church. So again, despite all of this happening, the Lord has blessed us, yeah. as I know he's blessed others. And so none of, our, none of our timeline has changed. And so we're excited about that. And again, we just want to give you that update. But thank you for your prayer. Thank you for your financial support. We appreciate each and every one of you, and we love you. Thank you so much. Bye. So much. Bye. All right, that's a blessing for sure. You continue to pray uh, for Brother Caleb and Autumn as they, uh, as they continue to seek the Lord's will. And you know, the Holy Spirit is not bound by time and space or location. And I'm thankful that the same Holy Spirit that speaks to us through the preaching when we're all gathered together is the same Holy Spirit 
who can use the Word of God to speak to our hearts uh, through a live stream service. And, uh, and so uh, we rejoice in all that God is doing uh, all around the world. And so uh, in addition to uh, praying for our missionaries, we want to pray for those right here within our church. We want to continue to pray uh, for Brother Bernie Braun and Gary Vital, Sharon and Sue Lepley, uh, Hunter Sergal, Amari Martin. Uh, pray for Shirley Gardner, Sheila Sundrela, Scott Carpenter, uh, Rick Wiedner, Michelle Cashew. Uh, pray for Brother Roger Curris, and uh, as he continues to recover from a fall, uh, the Wolverton family, unsaved loved ones, and then also continue to pray. Someone uh, sent me a note this afternoon, pray for Brother and Mrs. Barker, uh, Joel and Arlene uh, Barker. They're a little under the weather, and so uh, pray for them, if you will, that the Lord would bring healing to their bodies. And so, uh, and then, of course, we want to pray for our leaders. The, the Bible is very clear that uh, we're to pray for kings and for all that are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. And the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, the Bible says. As rivers of waters, he turneth it with us every will. And so our responsibility is to pray for them. And uh, I know all of us have strong opinions about uh, different things. And, and uh, we may not always agree with our political leaders and the decisions they make. Uh, but, uh, but their heart is in the Lord's hand, and we can rest assured of that. And so let's pray for them diligently, fervently. And, uh, and then, of course, in everything, give thanks as we're instructed to do in the scriptures as well. Pray for those who are on the front lines of the medical field. And uh, this, uh, this this past week, many of you may have seen uh, the, uh, we put a little thing on social media about it. We were able to be a blessing to some of the nurses over at St. Joe's and uh, Chick-fil-A sandwiches and, and uh, bottled waters with our church name and logo and John 3.16 printed on it and, and uh, just trying to do what we can to be a blessing and a help uh, and let those people know that we genuinely care about them and so uh, pray for all of those who are in the healthcare industry and so uh, let's have a word of prayer and then uh, we'll have a special and come back with the message tonight. Our Father, we thank you for being our God. You're so gracious and so kind and so good to us and uh, Father, we couldn't ask for anything more, and we have no right to complain. And, and so many times I find myself uh, a little bit uh, complaining, and, and Father, that's sinful, that's wrong, shouldn't do it. And uh, Father, quickly I try to remind myself uh, of your goodness and, uh, and, and all the things that you have done uh, for me. Father, I pray that you'd give us a spirit of gratitude, a spirit of praise, a spirit of worship. And, uh, Father, I pray that you'd meet with those in our church family tonight who are struggling. And, and this is not a lengthy list. The folks that we mentioned a few moments ago, no doubt there are many others. We want to continue to pray for Javier Saldana and Frank Saldana and, and uh, many others that uh, we may not have specifically mentioned tonight. And yet uh, the needs are many, and we ask you to be gracious on their behalf. Uh, Father, I ask you to be with uh, with uh, Kevin and, and Shay Lewis over in, in Minnesota as uh, they're expecting a new little one here uh, in the next several days. And Father, I pray that you'd give a safe delivery and, and just have your hand of protection and watch care over them. And uh, so many folks who are associated with our church who just uh, need to hear from you in a variety of ways. And we know that you're the great physician, you're the healer. And uh, there's nothing that, uh, that is too small for us to bring before you. As we talked about this morning, our cares are your care. And I ask you to help in every situation. Bless the remainder of this service. I pray that you bless our missionaries. Thank you for Brother Caleb and his wife and their burden to plant a church in the Bay Area. I pray that you'd prosper them. I pray that you'd go before them. And, and uh, even now, prepare the hearts of those out in San Francisco area that they'll minister to and, and give them an open heart, uh, a receptive heart for the truth of your word. Uh, bless uh, Brother Wynn there in Mexico City that we heard from this morning. And, and then, Father, I pray that you'd bless the message uh, here in a few moments. May it, uh, may it be used in our hearts to, uh, to be an encouragement to us and an encouragement to others through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
will tell us of all they've done and said. But there is only one King who rose up from the dead. And he stands above the rest, his name forever tremendous truth in that song Jesus what a mighty name the Bible says there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved and uh, so uh, what a blessing appreciate uh, the song tonight first Samuel in your Bible the book of first Samuel chapter 30 first Samuel chapter number 30 I want to give you just a brief truth tonight to try to help you and be an encouragement to you and try to give you some tools so that you can be an encouragement to yourself and, uh, and an encouragement to others. We live in very uncertain times, and so it's very important that we uh, kind of fill our toolbox a little bit with uh, being a blessing to other people. And so many times I have found that the best thing for me to do when, uh, when I'm a little bit melancholic, if you will, or uh, a little discouraged, uh, a little bit uh, uh, under the cloud, if you will, uh, to, the best thing is to go try to find someone else and encourage them. And uh, there's, no, there's no lack of that for sure. First Samuel chapter number 30, if you want to gather the family around the Word of God. And we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Second, uh, First Samuel rather, chapter 30 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away, and went on their way. Verse 3, So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives, and their sons, and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice, and wept, 
until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever been there where you just, you cried and you wept and you poured your heart out to the Lord until there was no more power to weep? That's, that's where David was. That's the, the dire circumstances that he found himself in. Look at verse 5. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, uh, Nabal the Carmelite. And verse 6 is our text, a familiar verse. The Bible says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. And here's the text, here's the statement. It says, But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, and Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. The ephod was symbolic of the Levites, the man of God. And David, uh, once he encouraged himself in the Lord, the first, notice the first place he went was to inquire of the Lord. Look at verse number 8. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Tonight I want to speak to you for just a few minutes on this subject, the cycle of encouragement, the cycle or the circle of encouragement. Let's pray together. Our Father, I pray that you'd help us in these next few moments. I want to be a blessing and a help to uh, these dear folks who've uh, uh, tuned in to the message tonight. Uh, Father, it's very important that we do what we can to protect our spirit and, uh, and to find encouragement in you and in your word. And then it's also important for us to not just keep that encouragement for ourselves, but that we transfer it to someone else and, uh, and be a blessing to others. Father, may we not lose sight of this. Uh, my concern tonight is that uh, with the quarantine and the social distancing and all of that, uh, uh, that, that folks would put themselves on an island and, and, uh, and, and withdraw from trying to be an encouragement to other people. Father, may, not, may that not be the case. Help us to do what we can uh, to be a blessing to others during this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. During this time of quarantine, your spirit is a target, and we've talked about that before. My spirit is a target uh, of Satan. If uh, Again, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear. And uh, tonight I want to once again drive home the truth of you and I keeping you ourselves encouraged. Some of what I say will be uh, things that, that, that may not be brand new to you, but hopefully uh, we'll say it in a way that can be easily applied to all of us this evening. We can't afford to live with a wounded spirit. We really can't. Very important, uh, as I mentioned in, in the prayer. And during these days of quarantine, where uh, you may be isolated from your co-workers, isolated uh, from friends that you're used to spending time with, isolated uh, from various people. And of course, we live in a day where communication is not a problem. Uh, we've got all kinds of means from the telephone to texting to social media and all those things. And, and uh, all of those things are, are fine and good if they're used uh, the right way, to be sure. And, uh, uh, but nonetheless, uh, if, we, if we're not careful, we can self-isolate to the point where, uh, where we become discouraged and when we no longer reach out to try to help someone else in their encouragement. Uh, a broken or bitter spirit is something that we cannot afford to have. Uh, it can easily happen because life happens to all of us. Circumstances that are beyond our control, events that we cannot see coming. And, and if you haven't yet have a, had a chance to listen to the message this morning, I encourage you to do that because we addressed uh, some of that in the morning service. But because of that, we must constantly be vigilant to make a study of our spirit. Dr. Lee Robertson was famous for saying, I'm always studying, uh, studying the response of myself, of Lee Robertson. He said, I want to know what makes me cry. I want to know what makes me happy. I want to know uh, what, uh, uh, what, what moves me to tears, what brings joy to my heart, what, what, uh, what stimulates me to, uh, to, uh, to try to be a blessing to someone else. And, and that's so important for us. Notice the story in our text very carefully. David is not yet the king, but he, ha but 
he is the leader of a group of people here in, uh, in, in Ziklag. He and his men, uh, they came home to Ziklag from a, a battle, only to find that the Amalekites had come and burned the city <coughs> and kidnapped all of the women and children. If you read that passage carefully, you'll find no one was killed. Uh, the Bible says neither great nor small, no, no children, no teenagers, no women uh, were, were hurt or, or killed, but they were all taken captive. They were all kidnapped uh, by David's enemies, if you will. And uh, David's wives were taken and his men's wives were taken and all the children were taken. The city was burned to the ground. Their homes were destroyed. Their businesses were gone. Everything was, uh, uh, was destroyed, but the people were saved alive. Now, what happened next is textbook human uh, nature acting out. What we see unfold in this story uh, is uh, we can learn a lot of lessons and we're reminded about a, a lot of things about our own nature. Notice with me what it says here in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and, uh, and verse number 4. It says, Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept, until they had no more power to weep. And, uh, and then down in verse number 6, it says that David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. Now, you understand, uh, it was, David was going through the same distress as everybody else. Uh, it wasn't as if David's family was still intact and everybody else had been kidnapped. It wasn't as if David had not been personally affected by the crisis that was going on. No, David, he was as, he was as hurt as everyone else. But as the leader in this situation, the people, once the initial shock of what happened wore off, then they began to blame other people. They had to find somebody to blame for their own hurt. And so, naturally, David being the leader, what they did was, they said, David, this is all your fault. David, uh, if you hadn't led us away from Ziklag, if you hadn't uh, led us on, uh, uh, on the mission that we were on, we, uh, if, we, if we had left some, you know, it's easy uh, to sit back in hindsight and, uh, and be able to say what we should have done after the fact, isn't it? <laughs> that's very simple. And that's where David was. The people were blaming him. David, you shouldn't have taken us there. You should have left some people back home. I'm sure there's all kinds of, of uh, things, or, uh, uh, accusations being hurled David's way. But understand, the people wept until they had no more power to weep. They looked for somebody to blame. And that, that brings me to this, hurting people hurt people. Here were a group of men, boy, they were hurting. Their wives were kidnapped, their children were gone. They looked at the home place where they had reared their children, where they had, uh, they had uh, worked so hard to develop and to build those houses and so on, and it's gone, it's, 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 it's over with, and, 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 and they're hurting. And so they look at David, and, and they say, it's your fault, David. And the Bible says that they actually spoke of stoning David. They were gonna, they were gonna kill him. They were going to really take out their anger on him, hurting people hurt people. Many times we need discernment to know the difference between bad people and broken people. So many times we'll come across uh, people, whether it's out witnessing or in our, in our interactions with people, and sometimes people who come, who come across as what we would say, that's a bad person, and we understand all are sinners and so forth. That's not what I'm talking about now, but, but people uh, that we might mischaracterize as being bad because of something that we perceive in them, really, when you start digging a little bit in their background and their history and what's going on in their lives, you find that they're broken people, broken people. And you find Jesus many times in his earthly ministry uh, found himself serving and ministering to people who were broken. And by the way, broken people are usually, once you, once you communicate with them for a little bit, you find that they're open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You find that they're open uh, for, for help once you peel away the layers of hurt. And yes, these people spoke of stoning David because they themselves uh, were in a bad way. Notice the phrase in the middle of verse 6. The Bible says, The soul of all the people was grieved. The soul of all the people was grieved. Here's the root cause of their reaction against David. Their, their, their soul was grieved. Their soul was grieved. So here's David, greatly distressed because of his own family members that were missing. <clears throat> and now on top of that, uh, a mutiny that is uh, brewing among his own men. So what does he do? What's the answer? Where does he go? 
Well, who does he turn to? Uh, how does he go forward? Well, we find the answer at the end of that same verse where it says, but David, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You say, Pastor, why did he encourage himself? Well, the obvious answer to that is there was no one else there to encourage him. There was nobody there to put a hand on David's shoulder and say, David, it's going to be okay, man. There was no one there to, uh, uh, to, to bow and pray with David and say, hey, let's go to the Lord together. <clears throat> no, the Bible says David encouraged himself. I maintain tonight that David had a spirit that was in good shape. He encouraged his own spirit. And the, the message this morning, or tonight rather, is all about the cycle of encouragement. The word encourage means to add courage that makes it possible to go forward. You know, we can't go backwards. <laughs> you can't go back and relive yesterday as much as you might would like to. You may have made a mess of things in your past. You may have made some mistakes. You may have uh, really blown in some areas of life. But, but newsflash, none of us can go back and relive or fix anything that's in the past. We've got to go forward. We've got to go forward. Uh, we talk about the importance of encouraging one another. And, uh, and, and by the way, that doesn't necessarily mean joining each other's pity party. No, it means, it means, it means using scriptural tools, spiritual tools, uh, to encourage a brother or sister in Christ. It means challenging one another to go forward. Challenging one another to go forward. I don't think this verse means for a moment that David sat around sulking. I don't think that at all. Uh, uh, keep in mind, there was a big job that had to be done. The, the city was burned with fire. But even more importantly than that, uh, there were some people who were missing here. His, uh, the, all these, these uh, the, their wives and their children were gone and they had to be recovered and so forth. The, the, there was no time to sit around and, and sulk and feel sorry for yourselves. No, it, the, the, it was time to go and get the job done. The, the encouragement was to go forward. So, uh, while David uh, and, and while the people were sitting around talking about stoning David, their family members were being held hostage by the Amalekites. And David had to keep that in mind. Someone had to encourage David. And David said, you know what? I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. Now, here's the cycle very quickly of encouragement. The cycle of encouragement is this. When there's no one else there to encourage you, guess what? The Bible says greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. Those of us who are Christians, those of us who are believers, we have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. It's no accident that Jesus said to his disciples, he said, if, he, he said, if I go away, he said, it's necessary that I go away because if I do not go away, the comforter cannot come. He said, but if I do go away, he said, the comforter, uh, who, he's going to come and he's going to be with you. You see, Jesus, uh, in his earthly ministry, uh, he took upon himself the form of a man, and he was uh, limited to being in one place at one time, and he said, it's better for you that I go away. Why? Because we understand, and the disciples later understood, that the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, and he indwells every single believer. Boy, what a great comfort that is. The fact that God himself lives inside of you and I who are saved, and part of his job is to encourage us. He's the comforter. He's the one that, uh, uh, that uh, speaks to our spirit. He's the one that brings us comfort when no one else can. How many times have I uh, felt so inadequate standing before a group of, of bereaving people, a family who's lost someone who is dearer than life to them at a memorial service or a funeral service, and there'll be a, a casket that sits right there and uh, of someone who was, uh, who was truly beloved by, uh, by, by a grieving family. And there's no, there are no words to say that is going to take away their pain. But my prayer always has been, now, Holy Spirit, you know what to say to them. Holy Spirit, you know how to bring comfort uh, in a way that I can't, I can't do that. I can be here and I can, I can be available and I can try to, to uh, uh, maybe point some things from the scripture, from the word of God, to talk about heaven and the splendor of it, to talk about the, the, uh, the, the fact that there's going to be a resurrection one day, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and where the Bible says, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. I can do all of that, but really when it comes down to the, the work of comforting the Holy Spirit, there is no one better at it than he is. He's God. He's God. And so uh, there's a, the, the, this cycle of encouragement begins with David, the Bible says, encouraged himself. But wait a minute. 
that's not, a, that's not an arrogant statement. David encouraged himself. What's the rest of it? In the Lord his God. Encouragement begins with you being alone with God. Encouragement, you getting yourself off of that island of pity, off of that island of depression or discouragement, it begins with you spending time with the Lord. There is no substitute for that. There is no substitute for that. David encouraged himself. It wasn't a matter of, of him trying to psych himself up. It wasn't a matter of him uh, saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. No, no, no. It was David encouraging himself in the Lord. He spent time with God. By the way, this is David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. This was David, the songwriter. This was David, not just a mighty warrior, but David who had a, a special relationship with, with uh, God Almighty. This was David uh, who penned the words inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is David who said, uh, who, who, uh, who said uh, this I know, for God is for me. How, I wonder how many times where, and even in, on this occasion, where David, who is a little bit down, a little discouraged, a little depressed, a little isolated, and he said, maybe he thought to himself, you know what, the Lord is my shepherd. You know what? Through God I shall do valiantly. I wonder how many of those psalms that he penned came back flooding to his memory as he encouraged himself. It wasn't a, uh, uh, it wasn't a psychological uh, exercise that caused him to feel better. He didn't lay on somebody's couch and rehearse all of his problems to a doctor somewhere. No, what he did was got along with God and said, God, you're my encouragement. You're my strength. You're my best friend. You're the one who's gotten me to this point. You're the one that has led me thus far, and it's through your grace I'm going to go home. Hey, I'm simply saying David encouraged himself in the Lord is God. That cycle of encouragement started with God. It started with God. May I remind all of us tonight, whatever you're facing, whatever uh, your time of need is, whatever encouragement you need, it starts with your own personal walk with the Lord. Your own personal walk with the Lord. I saw a, a saying a couple weeks ago, and uh, it went something, I don't know, I'll, I'll misquote it, but uh, there are no sports. Uh, the shopping malls are closed. This is closed. Can't do that. Can't do that. And it's as if God is saying, do we have time to talk now? <laughs> I've removed all of these, all of these distractions from your life. I've removed all of these things that before would prohibit you. Oh, I don't have time to talk to God because there's a ball game that comes on at 9 o'clock. I don't have time to talk to you tonight, Lord, because I, I, I've got to run this errand. I've got to go here. I've got to do that. I'm so busy here and there. And, and, uh, uh, and, and, and Lord, <clears throat> when I have a spare, a spare moment, we'll spend some time together. Could it be that God is using this time in your life personally? Look, forget about all the politics involved. Forget about all of the uh, when things are going to restart in the economy and all that. Draw a circle around yourself for just a few moments and ask yourself, is God trying to get me to the place where I can? have no place to look to for encouragement but him. Someone once said, and rightfully so, when you come to the place where you believe that God is all you have, it'll be at that moment that you realize that God is all you need. And there's so much truth in that. Listen to me, friend. The cycle of encouragement starts by you getting alone with God on a regular basis. Give God the benefit of your doubts. When you're facing a problem, the first thing you ought to be reminded of is simply this. You know what? God's in control. God's in control. Uh, he, hasn't, uh, uh, he hasn't taken a nap somewhere. He's not uh, taking a day off. Uh, by the way, God is not quarantined, okay? God is not secluded to heaven with no permission to roam the earth right now, okay? So it's okay. We can all breathe a sigh of relief. He's still on the job. Uh, he would be considered an essential part of the, of the universe, okay? I think we can all agree with that. But he's in control. He's got everything in the palm of his hand. Rest assured, he's in control. Next, be careful what you say to yourself. Be careful what you say to yourself. Very encouraging, or very interesting, the, the way the Bible words this. It says, but David encouraged himself. Have you ever talked to yourself? Be honest. <laughs> uh, sure we have. Sure we have. David encouraged himself. Be careful what you say to you. Uh, you know, uh, David gave himself courage. 
You know, we're sometimes our own worst enemy by saying the wrong kinds of things to ourselves. Well, you know what? God's forsaken me. No, he hasn't. You're saying the wrong thing to yourself. Uh, well, you know, this, uh, you know, God's not been good to me. Well, you know, that's not true. God has been good to us. So don't say that to yourself. Uh, well, you know, uh, <clears throat> not, you know, no one loves me. Everybody hates me. <laughs> you know, I think I'll go eat worms. Uh, no, uh, <clears throat> be careful what you say to yourself. Make sure, what does the Bible say in Ephesians where it talks about being filled with the Spirit? This is interesting. It says, uh, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And then, the Bible's very specific, speaking to yourselves. Interesting. Speaking to yourselves, how? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. But he begins that statement by saying, speaking to yourselves. Look, when you speak to yourselves in psalms, you know what an encouragement that is? I try to make a point to spend some time in the book of Psalms every day. You know why? Because it's such an encouragement. It's such a thrill because I learn about God's character and God's love for me and God's care for me and God's strength and God's power and he's my high tower and he's my buckler and all these metaphors that, the, that, that are used in the book of Psalms to describe God's work in my life. You know what that does? It encourages me. Those are words I need to read from God's word to myself, to myself. So we said, first of all, uh, uh, give God the benefit of your doubts. He's still in control. Number two, be careful what you say to yourself. Number three, go to God first. Go to God first. David's first resource was the Lord. God wasn't a spare tire. God wasn't a 911 call. No, David was uh, his first response to trouble was he went to the Lord. Most of the time, our first response is to see how we can scheme our way, how we can plan our way, how we can, how we can uh, somehow uh, fix all of this by ourselves and our own strength. It doesn't work that way. Go to God first. And then next, be patient with others. Be patient with others. Uh, we read in verses 8 through 10 where David's own men spake of stoning him. You know what? He could have written all those fellows off as, as uh, failures. He could have written all those guys off and said, well, for, well forget about it. I'm, I'm, we're going to part ways right here. And, and uh, if that's the way you feel about me, uh, they spake of stoning him. They were ticked off at him. David understood that he was, he was hurting, but other people were hurting as well. May I say this tonight? Uh, everybody's in the same boat. <laughs> everybody's in the same boat. Let's be patient with one another. Let's, uh, let's be mindful to pray for one another. Hey, that person that you may be, a little, that you may be tempted to be bitter at or short with or, or, uh, or uh, give a sharp answer to, uh, uh, maybe to be critical of, let me ask you a question. Have you prayed for them? Have you taken them before the throne of grace? Have you gone to God on their behalf? That's what David did. In encouraging himself in the Lord, when he went to the Lord, I'm sure he poured out his heart to God and said, God, these men, my men, they're, they're speaking of stoning me. God, would you help me? Hey, listen to me. Be patient with other people. Be patient with others. Number five, don't break the cycle of encouragement. We said, first of all, that cycle begins with God. And that cycle is God encourages me. And then, wait a minute. The cycle goes on, I encourage someone else. God encourages me, and then I don't just take that encouragement and say, wow, this is awesome, this is great. I feel, I feel so much better, I'm encouraged, I think I'll go on. Wait a minute, there's another step to the cycle. It's me going to someone else and try to give them courage and try to help them, to give them a good word, to give them uh, a word from the Lord to try to share with them what God has done for me. You see, that, that, keeps the, that keeps the flow. That keeps the cycle going. God encourages me. I, in turn, encourage someone else. And, and hey, we need to keep that going. Uh, <clears throat> because one man was able to get along with God and find courage for himself in the Lord, he, in turn, was able to instill some courage in those 600 men. He said, hey, fellas, let's go get them. Uh, he uh, sent for the priest and, and, uh, or uh, one, one of the Levites, and he said, uh, uh, he said, I need to inquire at the Lord, what should I do? And uh, he said, should I go? God, should I go and pursue after these men? And the word from the Lord came back and said, pursue. Now, wait a minute. David couldn't go by himself. 
he needed some people to help him you know what uh <clears throat> we're in this thing together and when all the smoke clears from this hey there's a big job out there there's still a world out there that's dying and going to hell there's still out there uh, people out there who need jesus now more than ever and, and, hey this is no time for us to be introspective and lick our wounds so to speak and forget about the fact that god has put us here to fulfill the great commission we need some help so what do we need to do we find encouragement from god we get that encouragement we pass it on to someone else why because there's something that needs to happen there's a job that needs to be done. David said, hey, fellas, let's go get them. He said, we can do this. He said, let's go and recover all that, uh, that has been taken from us. I just heard from heaven, and everything is going to be right. Everything's going to be okay. Every home needs someone like that, an encourager. Every marriage needs an encourager. Every church needs a group of people who are encouraging. Every team needs encouragers. Every organization needs encouragers. For the sake of those in your sphere of influence, don't break the cycle of encouragement. Don't break it. Don't be the one who pours cold water on what's going on. Don't be the one who throws the wet blanket, as it were, on the goodness of God in your life. Give courage to those who follow you. Give courage to those who follow you. Just some, just some random thoughts here, some, some closing thoughts. One of the most powerful things you can say to a young person is, you know what, I believe in you. I believe in you. As you encourage yourself by spending time with the Lord, encourage your spouse, encourage your children. If you're still able to work, God, boy, that's, that's awesome. Praise the Lord for it. Encourage your coworkers. Give courage to those who work with you. Give courage to those who lead you. Let me tie all of this together very quickly and we'll be done. All of us need to be encouraged from time to time. The best way, as I mentioned before, to stay encouraged is first of all, spend time with the Lord and then encourage yourself through the scriptures. And then likewise, the best way for you to stay encouraged and keep going is to spend time with the Lord and encourage others. You see the cycle there? I get encouragement from the Lord and then I'm a conduit. Uh, uh, several months ago maybe a couple years ago now we were uh, preaching about living for others God wants us to be not a bucket but a funnel God doesn't want us to be just the place where blessings are deposited God wants us to be a channel of blessings a conduit of blessings a pipeline of blessings and you know something when I decide and when God sees that he can trust me to pass on what he gives to me to someone else, I believe God sends more through us so that we can help other people, so that we can help more people. The cycle of encouragement tonight, let's not break that cycle. Let's make sure that we encourage one another. Let's make sure that we do what we can. Oh, you say, but pastor, I'm really going through a tough time. I don't doubt that at all. I don't doubt that at all. There's a lot of people who are going through a tough time right now. But let's make sure that we don't allow Satan to isolate us to the point where all we're seeking for is pity from others and we don't give encouragement to anyone else. Let's be that conduit of God's blessings, that conduit, that channel, that pipeline for encouraging others. Last year, 1,500 churches in America closed their doors for the last time. Can you imagine that? Last year, in the year 2019, over 1,500 churches in the United States of America shut their doors and people walked away for the last time. Every time I think about that, I can't help but ask the question, why? Why? I wonder how many of those closings could have been prevented if someone would have decided to keep the cycle of encouragement alive. Was it a pastor who became discouraged and quit? Was it a deacon? Was it a Sunday school teacher? Was it a bus captain? Was it a group of people who just, who just became introspective and just became isolated in their thinking? And instead of, instead of getting encouragement from the Lord like David did when, the thing, when things weren't going well for him and encouraging someone else, maybe they just said, you know what, it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. You know, the truth is it is worth it. One last verse and we'll close. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse number 7. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smootheth with the hammer, him that smote the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering, and he that fastened it with nails, that it should not be moved. Here we see in Isaiah chapter 41, different contractors, if you will, on the job. It said the carpenter 
encouraged the goldsmith. It said, he that smootheth with the hammer, he that smote the anvil. You see, here's a bunch of contractors on a job. They, there was a job to get done. And each contractor, if you will, encouraged his other contractors. You know what? That's the way it ought to be in the work of God. That's the way it ought to be in a church family. In just a few minutes, we'll enjoy some fellowship, albeit a little bit uh, uh, unorthodox. <laughs> but uh, you know what? I'm looking forward to it. You know why I'm looking forward to it? Because I'm looking forward for the opportunity or to the opportunity to continue the cycle of encouragement. Now, your job and my job is every day get with the God of that book and get encouraged. Your job and my job is to spend time in, in that book and in the pages of the blessed word of God and be blessed by it and let the Holy Spirit comfort you and let the Holy Spirit challenge you and let the Holy Spirit speak to you and then somehow, some way, use that to encourage someone else. Oh, look, in these days of social media and texting and phone calls and so forth, let's use all of those, uh, those avenues for good and for God. Let's use those to encourage each other, to be a blessing to each other. Let's, hey, let's set aside the sharp tongue. Let's uh, set aside the sharp pen and the sharp text and the sharp post. And let's say, hey, you know what? I'm going to find somebody today to encourage because that's what God wants. That's that cycle from God to me to someone else to someone else to someone else to someone else. David encouraged himself, but not only himself. He encouraged 600 other men because you find, you read through the story, they did pursue and they did recover all and the job did get accomplished. We've got a big job to do. Let's be an encouragement to other people this week. I'm looking forward to being an encouragement to you uh, and I encourage you uh, to, uh, to come on down to the church and to uh, enjoy just some drive, drive-through fellowship, amen? And uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll enjoy the, uh, the lesson for the kids. And so uh, we'll look forward to that in just a moment. Our Father, I pray that you'd help us. Thank you for the truth of your word, how it helps us. And I pray that we would, on purpose this week, find encouragement, exhortation in the word of God. And may you speak to our hearts. And then, Father, may it not stop with us. Help us to use the means that you've given us to find somebody to be a blessing to, somebody to be an encouragement to. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. There the Jewish leaders brought up false charges against him, and Paul was taken prisoner and sent to Caesarea to stand trial before King Agrippa. Although King Agrippa found that Paul had committed no crime, because he was a Roman citizen and had appealed to the Roman emperor, Paul was sent to Rome. Under the watchful eyes of Julius, a Roman officer, Paul and a number of other prisoners boarded a large sailing ship that would carry them to many port cities on the long journey to Rome. Once aboard the ship, Paul was led on a winding journey that took him from Caesarea to Sidon to Myra to Nidus, and then around the island of Crete, where they docked at a place called Fair Havens. Getting to Fair Havens had been a long and difficult journey. Winter was approaching, bringing with it dangerous weather and sailing conditions. Paul pleaded with the sailors and officers to stay on Crete. Paul warned them, Continuing this journey will bring disaster to our ship, cargo, and our own lives. We should remain here. Despite Paul's warnings, the officer in charge was persuaded by the ship's captain to find a safer place on the island of Crete where they could spend the winter. Soon after they set sail, what was a gentle breeze turned into hurricane-force winds that blew their ship far off course and out into the open sea. The sailors tried to control the ship, but nothing they did could put them back on course. 
Exhausted, the sailors secured the ship as best as they could with ropes, and then let the storm drive them wherever it pleased. For many days, the ship sailed on raging seas under the black skies of the storm that blotted out the sun and the stars. Exhausted and starving, everyone on board began to lose hope that they would survive this voyage. All except for Paul. Paul stood in front of the crew and passengers and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not left Crete. But take courage. God's angel came to me last night and said that the ship will be destroyed, but all of us will survive. Even though we will be shipwrecked, God will save us. Finally, after 14 nights of fear and misery, the sailors sensed that the ship was approaching land. By measuring the water's depth, the sailors were able to tell that they were getting closer. They dropped the ship's anchors, hoping that they would stop before crashing against the rocks. Some of the terrified sailors couldn't wait to get off the ship and onto dry land, so they lowered the lifeboat to the water while pretending to lower anchors. Paul told a Roman officer what was happening and warned, Unless we all stay on this boat, you won't survive. Hearing this, the officer cut the lifeboat loose, and it fell away. Before the sun came up the next day, Paul urged everyone to eat, so they would have strength to survive the events that would take place that day. Everyone on board knew that their voyage would end with a shipwreck. Paul could see the fear and concern on their faces, so he offered them encouragement by reminding them that God said everyone on the ship would make it safely to shore. Paul then took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of the crew and passengers. He broke it into pieces and then began to eat. Everyone on board ate until they were full and they were strengthened and encouraged. At daylight, the sailors decided to run the ship aground. They cut away the anchors and aimed the ship for the beach. The ship slammed into a sandbar that was still a bit off the island shore. The ship wouldn't budge out of the sand, and the waves began to smash what was left of the ship into pieces. The Roman soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to stop them from swimming away and escaping. But one soldier, who wanted to spare Paul's life, stop the others from carrying out their plan. Some prisoners jumped overboard and swam ashore, while others survived by clinging to broken pieces of ship. In the end, everyone made it safely ashore on the island of Malta. All right, I appreciate that. And uh, that's a great story about the Apostle Paul and, uh, and the shipwreck there. Just a few questions uh, about the story. And so, kids, uh, here we go. Number one, why did Paul say they needed to wait before setting sail again? Why did Paul tell the people uh, not to set sail uh, there from, from the island? And then uh, question number two, did the ship captain listen to Paul? Did the captain of the ship listen to Paul's warning? Yes or no? Uh, number three, could the men control the ship during the storm? Could the men control the ship during the storm? All right, and then uh, next question, who assured the men on the ship that God would save them? Who's the one that stood up and said, everything's going to be okay? God is going to save everyone from drowning or from dying. And then uh, next question, what did Paul give to the passengers to give them strength? What did Paul give to the passengers to give them strength? And then last question, did Paul or anyone die in the shipwreck? All right, those are your questions. I believe there's six of them tonight. And so here are your answers. Number one, why did Paul say they needed to wait to set sail again? Why did Paul say they needed to wait to set sail again? The answer, because the weather conditions were too dangerous. He said uh, there's a storm coming and uh, we don't want to set sail. Number two, did the ship captain listen to Paul? No, he did not. 
he said, we're, we're sailing regardless of what you say. And uh, then a little bit later on, Paul said, I told you so. Uh, next question, could the men control the ship during the storm? No, they could not. The Bible says they lost control. They just let it drive. And the story goes, they uh, took up the sails and let the storm take the ship uh, where, the, uh, where it would. And then uh, next question, who assured the men on the ship that God would save them? That would be Paul, the apostle Paul. Uh, next question, what did Paul give to the passengers to give them strength, physical strength? He gave them bread. Uh, they, uh, he gave thanks for it and then gave uh, folks a little bit to eat. And then the last question, did Paul or anyone die in the shipwreck? And the answer to that is no. No one died during the shipwreck. And so there's your questions and answers. Of course, uh, mom and dad, send us a text. Let us know how your child did on that. We're looking forward uh, to recognizing all the young people who participate in the story time. And we're looking forward to seeing you in just a few moments. And again, just, uh, just a word of caution, please. Uh, don't get out of your car. The buildings will be locked uh, and not allowed to let anyone enter the buildings. Uh, and so we need to make sure we abide by that. But we'll enjoy some good uh, fellowship. And, and uh, if you want to do that, stay in your cars on, at the end of the parking lot or whatever. That's great. But uh, let's just uh, uh, enjoy this time. And then uh, let's have a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed. Our Father, we thank you for your goodness. I pray that you'd help us and uh, bless the fellowship that we'll enjoy here in a few moments. Thank you for the truth of your word. Help us to be an encouragement to others. Help us to get our encouragement from you and then to share it with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God.